Well, good morning once again, everyone. It's so good to see everybody. We just saw in that video that long tunnel walking down darkness and seeing the light at the end. You know, the truth of the matter is there is light at the end of the tunnel for those in Christ Jesus, that the best days are always ahead. Listen to me, the best days are always ahead. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. We're absolutely delighted that you're watching with us and participating with us today. And today we're gonna to talk about something that I think a lot of us are facing perhaps more than we have in our entire lives as a culture and as the world, and it's this. It's the cure for fear. How many of you wanna have a cure for fear? Because what is this whole series is about gain from pain. We have an opportunity to let these sets of circumstances make us better or make us bitter. Last week we spoke about all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. I encourage you to go to our website and check out with that. Today we're gonna to talk about the cure for fear. That's right, there is a cure for fear that obliterates fear and makes us to become bold and strong people. How many of you wanna be bold and strong? Absolutely, right? Well, before we do that, one of the ways we stay bold and strong is that we stay connected to God and each other. Just real quick, I wanted to give you a little bit of what's going on to help you. If you're not part of Cornerstone Church, you're not connected to someplace else, we wanna help you all stay connected, okay? And one of the ways we do that, we have a live broadcast from Tuesday to Friday at 12 noon, live at noon from the living room. We wanna encourage you to, to watch those. They're on our website, they're on Facebook. You can watch it live. Also, we have small groups via Zoom. If you're interested in getting involved with a small group, perhaps even starting one, all you have to do, if you wanna take a screenshot, is put Pastor Rich at cornerstonecheshire.com. All right, and so we'll find about those opportunities. Also, if you have any needs or requests or you know someone that's going through a difficult time, we're trying to stay, keep everyone connected. You can go to Janine at cornerstonecheshire.com. And finally, we have our connection card and our responses throughout the service. You can text to 94090 and you can um, get our connection card and fill that out. That would be awesome. We would like to be able to stay connected. If you have any prayer concerns, prayer requests, whatever needs you have, that's a great way to do it quickly and fast. Let's get right into our message today. And it's this. Proverbs 9.10 says the following. It says, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is taking knowledge and rightly applying it. I think right now we need a lot of wisdom, don't we? Absolutely. And so how do we get this wisdom? What's the foundation to everything is this? It's the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment and we need to make right judgments. The reason why you see the world off its axis so many times is there is a loss of the fear of the Lord. Now, before you shut me off and say, oh, here we go, it's gonna be one of those hot hell, fire and brimstone, judgmental, I hate the church for that, I don't want any part of it, I grew up that way, I don't want that. Let me just stop you before you shut me off. The Bible says, now is the road that leads to his salvation. And on that road, there are two ditches, some at the left and some at the right. And maybe you grew up in one of those ditches. There was a time that the church in our American culture, maybe not in other parts of the world, where it became really legalistic, that if you didn't do all the things right, you're going to go straight to hell and burn in hell because God's angry with you. And maybe you grew up with long dresses down to your ankles and the women had these Pentecostal buns. I don't know if you know what that is. They're, they're not cinnamon buns. They would tie their hair up in a big bun because they wouldn't cut their hair. You know what I call that? Bundage. All right, and that's what used to happen. It was all about, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other, and it's judgmental. You would come to church and they would have a, literally, I'm not making this up, they would measure how far your skirt was from your knee. I mean, stuff like that, insane, right? All about works, 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 works. And so what happened was there was so much emphasis for a period of time in the culture of the American church that we went to the opposite extreme. Then, God's your best friend. Oh, we want to let go of all that legalism. In fact, some of the most egregious people on television grew up in the era of strict fundamentalism, 
legalism, they went to the extreme and put a lot of makeup on and dressed crazy. I mean, you saw two extremes. Both are terrible, but somewhere in the middle. And so today I want to help us to understand when I mention the fear of God is actually the, one of the most liberating things that you and I can find. Because it's not the kind of fear you're thinking of. Because God, the reason why you're alive is because God loves you. Let's get right into it as we move forward. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. I love what Charles Spurgeon says, a great teacher uh, who's now with the Lord says this. He who fears God has nothing else to fear. He or she who fears God has nothing else to fear. How would you like to live your life? Imagine your life where you fear nothing but God. Imagine you don't worry about your boss. You don't worry about the economy. You don't worry about anything. You're just concerned by one only, God. How freeing would that be? You're like, well, I don't want to be afraid of God. I thought God's a big teddy bear in heaven. What, what's the deal? And so we had this view of God as an angry uh, man with a big cane, or we had this um, Barney God. You know, Barney the dinosaur. I love you, you love me. Hello, kids. <laughs> okay, when it's all about do whatever you want to do. Both are wrong. God is amazing. God is powerful. God is passionate. And it's my prayer today, about the end of this time today, that you and I have something to work on to allow ourselves to drive out fear and bring in faith, okay? That's what we want to be able to do. Those who fear man will fear everything. If you fear man, you will fear everything. You fear God you'll feel nothing but God. That's liberation, absolute liberation. You see, here's some truths, everybody. God is more passionate about you than you are for him. Any desire that you have to go after God, he's more passionate than you are. So if you have any inclination to chase God, he's already chasing you. But there's a responsibility that you and I have. We literally have to grab the opportunity. We don't make the opportunity. The opportunity is there. God's already paid for something for us, but we have to go and receive what he's given us. All right, it's almost like uh, if you're dirty and you're, you're sick and, and you're thirsty and you're dying of um, dehydration and you're like, I'm really thirsty, I need to drink. And we put right before you on a table, we put water and you say, and you refuse to drink it. We put it right there before you. All you have to do is walk across the room, open the bottle, pour it in a glass and drink and you'd be fine. Well, that's what Christ has done for us. God has delivered all of this for us, but we still have to do our part. We don't work for it, but we work from it. So God is more passionate about you than you are for him. James 4, 5 says this, or do you suppose it is no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, that God yearns jealously for you that when you give your life to him, and you're thinking, why would he yearn jealously? That whole yearning is he desires. It's a very strong word. It would almost be the kind of word you use in a romance novel where the young man yearned for the woman or the woman yearned for the man. That kind of yearning where they think about each other. You're like, oh, come on. Are you telling me God thinks about me? Hold on, yes, he does. He absolutely does. So he yearns jealously. Now, if I, if, if I go out to lunch with you or dinner and I'm sitting there with you and you're trying to talk to me and I'm looking at my phone, which by the way, I do. I'm looking at my phone. Mm-hmm, yep, mm-hmm, yep, mm-hmm. Will you want to spend any time with me? No, if I'm not paying attention to you. And so, you know, God, we're with God so many times and we're so distracted, especially right now where we're having church from home, right? It's so easy to run across the room and do something else or look at, the, um, look at your phone. But when you're spending time with someone, it's important that you give them for your full attention. And God yearns jealously for you. He loves you. He wants you. He really, really does. So in Psalm 139, 16, it says this. You saw me. This is how God thinks about you, okay? I want you to hold on and listen to this. You saw me, that's you, before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God knew. How precious are your thoughts about me? That's right. His thoughts are precious about you. Oh God, they cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, 
you are still with me. Oh, come on, really? Yes. God does not exaggerate. Exaggeration is a way of lying. That God thinks about you more than the grains of sand on the beach. How do you know that? The Bible says it. He thinks about you. He knows every component, every molecule, every instance of life inside you. In fact, this is what they say. One cubic foot of beach, that's cubic foot, 12 all around. You know what? It has 1.8 billion grains of sand. And yet God thinks about you more than all the grains of sand on the planet. How can you say that? The scripture says it. It's true, everybody. He thinks about you. He loves you. He wants you. He designed you. You are, you are the height of his creative order on earth. And so he desires. So please understand, God's default setting is to love and to reach out to us. Please understand that. He's not looking for an excuse to wipe you off the face of the planet. If you are breathing and your heart is beating, God has a plan for your life. You see, Psalm 89, 7 says this, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence, reverence, respecting by all those around him. You see, God is more passionate about you than you are for him. So I want to share with you some story about the Bible, two, about two or three stories today to help illustrate the passion of God. You ever hear of Moses? Yeah, Moses was a great guy. He grew up, he was in slavery. The Jewish people, his mother saw how beautiful he was. She put him in a basket on the Nile River to hide him because the Egyptians were killing the firstborn or killing the boys. And Pharaoh's daughter saw Moses, took him as her own son. And so Moses grew up in the palace of Egypt as pretty much the grandson of Pharaoh. He had the best education and everything. What happened when he was 40, he tried to liberate his people. He killed a man. He had ran into the desert. 40 years, a refu uh, he was a, a, refuge, a refugee in another country. He struggled at the year of 80 years old. He was taking care of sheep one day. He went to Mount Sinai and he saw a burning bush. And out of that bush, God called him. God spoke to him. God said, here I am. And what did Moses do? Moses could have kept on walking. But he said, I want to see what's going on. So he investigated. And to make a long story longer <laughs> is God called him. And he had an encounter with Almighty God. He saw God as a man sees a friend. He spoke to God. He had communion with God. And this is what God told Moses. As you're experiencing me, you're the prototype of what I want the whole nation. So I want you to do is take the entire nation and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And I want you to bring them to the same mountain so the people can have the same exact experience you're having with me. I don't want another intermediator. I want you to bring them to this mountain and I'm going to show myself to them like I showed myself to you because I love them and you're my deliverer. I'm using you to do that. That was Moses' purpose. Moses goes back to Egypt. He goes to Pharaoh. He does not say to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let us take the people to the promised land. He doesn't say that. He says, let, him let us take him to the desert so they can worship God. The purpose of Moses initially was not the promised land, was to meet the promiser. That when you know the promiser, you can handle the promised land. But if you go to the promised land, you don't care about the promiser. Do you see that, everybody? And so that's exactly what the purpose was. So all this goes on. All right, gets out of Egypt, miracles take place, 10 plagues, they cross the Red Sea, they do all these things. And now Moses brings the people to the very place where he met God. He wanted them to have face to face with God. So now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, let me go ahead. The mountain wasn't smoking, it was smoking. Okay, so what happened was this. Moses told the people, consecrate yourself for three days. Get ready. God is going to meet you at the base of this mountain. So the people cleanse themselves. They get ready. And lo and behold, the fire is burning. And now think about the trumpet, lightning, sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. The people were what? They were terrified, the Greek, Hebrew word there. They were terrified and trembled. They were shaking. They were freaking out. It's like a bolt of lightning. If you get have a bolt of lightning come close to you and a clack of thunder, whoa, I mean, it scares you to no end, right? Well, that's what they were experiencing. 
Okay, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood afar off. They're like, I can't handle this. I cannot handle this, this greatness of God. And said to Moses, hey, 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 Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Okay, it sounds like a reasonable thing to do. But God said, I want you to bring these people to the mountain. I want them to find me and see me. I want them to have a relationship with me. So what happens next? So Moses said to the people, I want you to pay close attention here. This is very, very key. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. Wait a minute here. He's telling them not to fear. Listen to this. Do not fear. Okay. For God has come to test you that you may fear. Don't fear so you can fear. Why is that? Because it's not the kind of fear we're thinking about here. God does not want you to be scared of him. God wants you to have reverence and yes, a fear of him. It's almost like, I remember for one time I went to here, I went and so it was a huge storm in Texas. And in Texas, you can see the storm coming and I was hiding out in the, in the, in the car and I saw the lightning and thunder and the winds blowing. I'm like, wow, it was awesome. The lightning, I could see lightning going. I was kind of freaking out, a little bit fearful, but I was comforted in the car, but I had a respect for the storm. And that's kind of how it is, that you're safe in God, but you need to respect him, that he's powerful, everybody. I mean, what are we? What is man that you should think of him? So Moses says, don't be afraid of him, right? Do not fear of God has come to test you that your fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. And so God doesn't want us to sin. Why? Because it takes us away from God. You see, the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. God wanted the Israelites to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And Peter, it says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation once called out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So what has happened since Christ died on the cross, he got rid of the middleman and now you can go right to Jesus. That's always been God's design and God's hope and God's purpose. So I hope, hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. Moses brought the people to the mountain to experience God face to face as a kingdom of priests. The people said, no, 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 no. We don't want to do it. Moses, you go for us. Why? Because when God's light shines on you, you find out who you really are, and it's scary. There has to be a reaction. If you wanna be your own God, you don't wanna let go of that. My friends, God is calling us to himself. Yeah, it's scary, but God is a benevolent, loving God who loves you, and you can be secure in him, but you must be willing to let it all out and all for him, holding nothing back. You know, I can say right now, as I'm standing here, I have nothing to be ashamed of. I'm completely fine with God right now. And you can be that way too, even more than that. So the people stood afar off. As a result, they kept apart. Why? Because they did not want to embrace fearing God. They wanted Moses to be the person. They feared God out afar. God wants the fear to draw you closer, not further away. You see, the fear of the Lord is to be terrified to be without him. Uh, this past week, we had a chance to have a, um, a Zoom call with John Bevere, great, great author, a meeting about uh, 80 pastors, and we were talking to him, and he shared this quote, and I thought it was phenomenal. He said, the fear of the Lord is to be terrified to be without him, that I want God. I don't want to be without God. It's like jumping out of a plane and not having a parachute versus jumping out of a plane and having a parachute. I'd be terrified to jump out of a plane without a parachute. And that's how much we should rely upon God. That's how we've been designed to rely upon God. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He does not want us walking around cowering. He wants us to walk around bold, shoulders back, head up, really confident, not confident in ourselves alone, but confident in Him and us. Because you've been designed to be confident. You've been designed to be very productive. And so have I. And so what we do is we substitute God for some other things. And then we're insecure. 
It's been that way from the very beginning when Adam and Eve sinned. They took God's covering off and they tried to cover up for themselves. My friends, you are made to be dressed with God. You are made to have God at the center of your being. And when you do, everything works. And when you don't, things break. You break and other people break. You see, I like what Oswald Chambers says, one of my favorite authors of devotionals. He has a book called My Utmost for His Highest. This is what he says. The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Think about that for a moment. I fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. What an opportunity we have, everybody. Have I arrived there? No, I have to work on this. I don't work for it. I work from the, who I am in God to let us freedom come. And the Philippians says this, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring into completion. God wants to do a good work in you. He put a good work in you to bring to completion at the day of Christ. Now listen to this one. Later on in the chapter, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, check this out, work out your own salvation. Wait a second. That's legalism. That's Old Testament. You can't work for your salvation. Christ has worked it for you. You're absolutely correct. You cannot save yourself. He's not asking you to work for your salvation. You cannot work for your salvation. You're not good enough, and neither am I. That's not what we're talking about. What he says is work out what's inside of you. When you gave your life to Christ and you surrender to him, you are justified. You are right before God. Then God puts his kingdom inside of you. Now our job is to work out what he's worked in us. When you hear that inner voice saying, forgive somebody, that's not your idea. That's the spirit of God in you. So therefore, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why do I have to work out my salvation with fear and trembling? Because God is at work within you. It's God in you. That's right. When you give your life to Christ, he comes inside of you, everybody. And he wants to work out his plan for you. He's put it inside. That's why Jesus said, out of your innermost um, being will flow rivers of living water. It's what he's deposited. Our job is get the boulders out of the way and let that, sp that spring of life flow out of us and transform us and saturate us. God has a plan for you. And for me, I want to work out his plan with fear and trembling because it isn't my idea to do these things. It's not your idea to forgive other people. Anytime you have a good idea, that's from God because every good and perfect gift comes from him. I hope you see what I'm saying here. You don't work for your salvation. You work from your salvation for it is God who is at work with you. So when God says forgive someone, forgive someone. When you hear that still small voice, don't be looking at that. Don't be doing that because you're limiting yourself from God. That's, just, that's the fear of God inside of you. A reverence for God. Now, I want to show you uh, as we conclude with one more, two more illustrations is this. In the Old Testament, this is after Moses um, established it. They were traveling around. And, uh, and what happened was there were these priests, Aaron's son. Moses' brother had a couple sons. Don't name your children this, by the way. I, I know you're real, real tempted when you see these names. You might not name your cat that, but not your dog. Okay. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer. They were priests. They had to take care of God's presence. God's presence was so powerful in that day. I mean, let me stop you for one second. For 40 years, the Israelites had a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. God gave them manna, quail, took care of them, gave them water. His power was so strong and so powerful. Jesus says this, too much is given, much is required. There was such a heaviness. The Bible says in the New Testament, let not many of you become teachers because those who teach will be held to a higher standard. Yeah. That's right, I'm held to a higher standard. Why? Because I'm bringing the truth. If I bring the Bible for a way to help pad my own pockets and to, and to build myself up so I can be powerful, I'm in trouble. Yeah, it's humbling, everybody. When I realize that, this is God's word, and for me to siphon off of that for myself and not let him bless me, well, that's what was going on with these guys. They did not treat God power, um, respectfully. 
Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered an unauthorized, they did it their own way, fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. And fire came out before the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Wow, that's the Old Testament. Well, let's go ahead nearly a thousand years. In the book of Acts, Jesus arose from the dead, went into heaven. His, this, his church started with 120, 3,000, 5,000. They were growing like crazy. They had such miracles. The Bible says that even Peter's shadow healed people. I mean, there were signs, there were wonders. God's power was high voltage. Okay, it was high voltage. And there was such an anointing, such a power. Too much is given, much is required. God gave them high voltage lines to deal with. There was a guy by the name of Barnabas. Barney, I like to call him. And he was a wonderful disciple. He sold his land and brought the money to the disciples' feet. The church knew about that and he became, wow. He brought all the money to the church, but he did it in the right reason. So they had this couple, Ananias and fire, saying, huh, why should Barney get all their accolades? I want to be known in the church, you know? I want to be entitled. Watch out for people who want to become famous in the church. If you desire a title, chances are you're entitled and you're dangerous. We should be willing to lay down our titles and make sure only he's up there. So what happened? Let's sell our land for maybe a million dollars or whatever it is, and let's hold back maybe 20% of it, and we'll tell the church we gave it all, just like Barnabas, and that way we'll rise up. Why should Barney be the big guy in the church? Does this happen today? No, not at this church. <laughs> and, and, so what happens? They lie, excuse me. They lie, and what happens is they go, they go to Peter, the husband dies and the wife dies to drop dead. And what does he say? You've lied to the Holy Spirit. Now you're saying, isn't that extreme? Yeah, it is extreme. You know why? Too much is given, much is required. Why do we not see the miracles? There's miracles around the world right now happening. There's, I've seen God do miracles, but why don't we see the proliferation and the strength of high voltage Christianity is because God loves us too much to give us high voltage where we can hurt ourselves. Much is given, much is required. If we don't fear God with the low voltage stuff, why is he gonna give us high voltage? Do you see that everybody? That's an act of love. I'm not gonna let my child be home by itself at four years old. Or if it's 24 years old and it can't handle himself, why would I give a, a child a car? Unless it shows that it's responsible. And so this is what happened. Great fear, listen to this. Great fear came upon the whole church and all who heard it, and more signs and wonders began to happen. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done by the people, by the hands of the apostles. So what happened was Ananias and Sapphira lied. They didn't fear God. And then there was a great fear over the church. And what happened? There was a more of a proliferation of signs and wonders. My friends, I'm telling you right now, if you and I will fear God, not be afraid of God, but respect God, and respect his name, jealously protect his name, not to use a church as a platform because you're a failure in your regular life. I've seen it happen. This is not American Idol to be in the worship team. This is not a place where you can get on a platform. I want to preach. Really? No, it's not about that, everybody. God forbid if I get that way. No, it's about honoring God. And if we'll honor God and fear God, what happens is he pours more of his power more of his strength, more of his anointing. You want to see more of God in your life? Fear him more, reverence him more, and you'll see more supernatural things happen in your life. Not to give yourself a big name, but to let his name be big in you. How much better is that, everybody? Absolutely, absolutely. You see, I like what Kevin DeYoung says. There is no, check this out. There is no sin so prevalent, so insidious, and so deep as the sin of fearing people more than we fear God. 
when you fear people and what people think about you, well, I'm 28 and I'm not married yet. Therefore, I'm going to go with this person that's not saved. I'm going to do this because I want to fit in. I, I want to fit into the crowd. I, you know, all everyone at schools is, is vaping. They're doing pot. And they're doing drugs and people are going around, sleeping around. I, I want to be cool, too. I, I, I want to be accepted in the crowd. I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be in the lunch table by myself. I'm going to go ahead and do this. Everyone else is doing it. I want to be accepted. And I don't care about the fear of God. I want to be accepted by people. And what happens as a result of that, it causes pain in your life, in my life. When we want to be feared, when we fear people and their opinions, and even your own opinion of yourself, it is slavery. You can never measure up. How much better is it when I don't care what anyone else thinks? Think about the freedom. I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about the freedom, junior hires, high schools, students, college, young professionals, whoever you are, churchgoers, anyone for that matter. Imagine you don't care what people think of you. I know who I am in God. Imagine no more intimidation with people, no more fear. How awesome would that be? That's the invitation God is giving us. That's the freedom we have by fearing God. Everything else goes away. Check it out. That's an amazing quote. Here we go as we conclude. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. As I started out today, you're dying of thirst and there's water at that table. You have to go to it. God provides it for you. He saved you. You can't save yourself. Christ went to the cross, but you have to go and you have to take it. You have to reach out to it. Here's another one, everybody. You'll be as close to God as you want to be. Let me say it again. You'll be close to God as you want to be. It's up to you. God's waiting, but he will not force his hand. He's provided the way, but you and I have to go after him. That's right, we have to chase him. The funny thing is we don't have to chase him. He's right here. We have to chase him, run away from these other things and run to him. He wants you. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to pour out his power. He wants to pour out his love. He wants to pour out signs and wonders, but he doesn't want to pour it out at your demise and my demise. He doesn't want to give us more than we can handle, though we hurt ourselves and we're responsible for more things. He doesn't want to do that because he loves us so much. He loves us so much. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their limb. That's what we're praying. That's what God would have for us as individuals. Now, what does this all mean? Here's Jesus talking, okay? This is Jesus, quoting Jesus here. If you want to be my disciple, follower of me, you must, by comparison, check this out, by comparison, hate everyone else. You're like, hey, I'm doing good, I hate everyone. No, 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 no. <laughs> He's not saying hate your mother-in-law, hate your wife, hate your kids. No, 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 hate your pastor, no, no. Hate your president, no, he's not saying that. Listen to this, if you want to be my disciple, he asked us, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters. Yes, check this out. Even your own life in comparison to God. Why would God say that? We mentioned it last week. You're designed by God for God. You are, you are void of your warranty. When you are about you, when it's about you and not God, you hurt yourself. You're wired for God. And you take God out, it's like throwing a CPU motherboard out and putting a piece of junk inside. Everything goes crazy and locks up in your life. Okay? So you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be your disciple. He's not saying, just repeat after me the sinner's prayer. I gave my life to Christ. Good, you're all set now. I heard something very sobering. There was a televangelist that was involved with fraud and deceit, went to prison. And he was visited by another pastor. And the pastor said to him, what happened to you? How did you fall into sexual sin, defrauding people? He said, you know what happened? The pastor asked him, the guy in prison, did you not love God? Oh no, I love God. 
I always loved God. I honestly, I always loved God. Then what was the problem? I loved God, but I didn't fear him. I'm sad to say, I think the American church, the Western church today, we love God. Yeah, we do. We sing about him. Oh, how I love you. But we don't fear him. We don't. We don't. How do you know we don't fear him? When you, for, when you refuse to forgive somebody, when you just do whatever you want to do and don't care what God says about it, well, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. That shows me and shows God and shows myself you don't love him. Jesus is what Jesus says. If you love me, you will obey my commandments and I will show myself to you and give you a comforter. If you love him, you'll obey him. Think about that for a moment. If I love my wife, Sandra, so much, but if I'm running out, looking at other women, trying to, does that love? No. God's, God's very exclusive. You're made for him by him. He wants you to love him. And so it's so important. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Here are some truths today. God is more passionate about you than you are for him. God wants you to fear him, not to be afraid of him. Please understand, okay? When you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. Imagine your life, my life, this pandemic, eh. Am I worried about it? A little bit, but I can honestly tell you, I'm not that worried about it. Because what's the worst thing that can happen? I go to heaven. <laughs> it's not so bad. Right? I'm seriously. I'm, am I concerned? Yeah. Am I having a healthy fear of being careful? Absolutely. That's why we're not having church right now. I'm not being an idiot. I believe that God gives us minds, right? So what does this all mean? Well, check this out as we conclude. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God did not come to damn you. If God wanted to damn you, he would have damned the world already. Please understand that. I don't know what kind of church you grew up in where the pastor spoke about hell and act like he was there before. He knows it and likes it. That's not us. We don't want anyone to go to a place called hell that's void of God. <laughs> you don't even want to know what that is, right? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. God wants to save us. That's why he did something extraordinary. He sent himself and died and took all of his reputation and threw it at us that we could be with him. Now, this is a very famous verse, the one before it. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Okay? He did not come to condemn the earth. But if you don't believe in him, you're already condemned. That, doesn't seem, that does not seem fair. Well, hold on. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, everybody. The light has come into the world and people loved their darkness. The, the Israelites before the mountain said, I want to kind of hide in my darkness. If I give it all to God, he's going to see my darkness. I don't want to surrender it all. I want to keep these a couple of things. I want to go to church. I want to appreciate God. I'll go to church. I'll give. I'll go to a mission trip. But don't touch this area. Don't touch this unforgiveness. Don't touch this sexual issue I'm dealing with. Don't touch this money issue I'm dealing with. Don't touch this. But I'll do this. And God says, sorry. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. The light has come into the world and people love their darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Well, what happens to people that never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? God will judge you based upon what you know and you will have to go before God one day. Everyone has to go through Jesus and the only assurance to go to heaven is through Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. No one goes to the Father except through Jesus. Do you know where you're going today? You see, this is the truth. Now we go before that verse. We always quote this one. I just went after John 3, 16. For God so loved, agape the world. That's God so loved you that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should have everlasting life. God loves you so much. He really, really does. He loves me. He gave it all for you and I. He wants you to fear him so you can be in freedom. He who fears God has nothing else to fear. Imagine living a life. You're not afraid of today. You're not afraid of tomorrow. You're not afraid of eternity. You're not afraid to die. God's got you. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. 
you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day. Maybe you used to walk with God and you walked away. Maybe you always had, I will, but I won't do that. You always had a clause. If you have not given him all, you've given him nothing. God does not compromise. You wouldn't marry someone, would you? If they said to you, I'll, I'll, I'll be your wife, but I want this other person too. Would you marry that person like that? No way. Neither will God come into your life until you're willing to forsake all others and say, you know what? It's just God. Are you going to mess up once in a while? Yes. But you need to make that decision. Have you given it all to Jesus? God's allowing this to take place in our, on our planet right now. This fear we're all facing. Why is he allowing it? Because he's showing us how much we need him. This is his grace. He didn't cause it, but he's allowing it to take place. My prayer is don't let this pandemic go to waste. Now is the time to get right with God. If you want to give your life to Christ for the very first time, or if you never really did it, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer in your heart. Ready? Just repeat in your heart. Lord Jesus, go ahead. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to follow you all the days of my life. I step down from being in charge of my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you now are a child of God, born again. I'm gonna ask you to do me a big favor. If you could just um, put 94090 on your text and let you know that you made that decision to God, okay? 94090. One other thing I wanna ask you, can we pray that you and I would develop a fear of God? We need a fear of God in our culture. God wants to pour out such power on the church, upon you and I, that we could transform the world. But we need to fear Him. So can we pray that right now? Everybody, let's pray this. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us. You have good plans for us. And Lord, we thank you. We don't want to fear man. We don't want to fear anything. Father, we ask us, Lord, give us a holy fear of you. Give us a holy fear of you that we fear you only. We don't fear what people think about us. We don't fear tomorrow, but we just want to fear you. I ask you to set us free in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to pray that prayer. Well, as we're moving forward today, as we conclude today, uh, there's about three different ways. We want to thank you for your faithful giving. I thank you so much. And I really appreciate it. Not just me, but our church. We're able to support our missionaries. We're able to make a difference in the communities and around the world. If you want to give, you can text Cornerstone Cheshire to 77977. You can use Push, push Pay through our Cornerstone app, or you can mail the old fashioned way. Also, right now, after this service, if you gave your life to Christ, please put that down. 94090, okay? And if you also want someone to pray for you, we have Zoom rooms right after the service. Right after the service, immediately, you can go to a Zoom room. You don't have to put your camera on. You can just do it audibly, and you can talk to somebody, and they can pray for you privately if you'd like. You go into a room, you say your name, whatever, and they can take you to a private place to pray. Listen, don't go alone. God loves you, and he's got great plans for you. The best is always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. God bless you guys. Stand by for a little puppet thing, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.